What's going on everyone, Josh Rozepka here, and welcome to the eighth installment of my interview series where I spoke with 17 world-class trumpeters. In each of these videos, I present one question, and then you hear that question answered in sequence by all 17 trumpeters. As a reminder, here's who you'll be hearing from in order of appearance of today's video. Ingrid Jensen, Roger Ingram, Michael Sachs, Randy Brecker, Selena Ott, Pacho Flores, Chris Coletti, Kenny Rampton, Bijan Watson, Tina Tinghouseth, Taga Larson, Jose Cibaja, Bria Skomberg, Arturo Sandoval, Leslie Vonner, Karen Bliznik, and Brian Lynch. So far in this series, you've heard a lot of terrific advice about preparation and practice and many stories of inspiration. However, the musicians that we become are just as much a reflection of what we don't practice versus what we do practice. With that in mind, I decided to ask everyone the following question. What do you think is the most neglected aspect of practice or preparation? Everyone's answers and insight will inspire, motivate, and challenge you in the best possible way. So I hope you're ready to sit back and relax, and let's hear what everyone had to say. Probably the body. I would go more than, well, when I think of my students, a lot of times, you know, they'll come in the room and, and we're like, we want to get playing right away. I'm like, yeah, but your shoulders are all tight. What's the point of that? We can't, everything we're about to work on right now is going to be more work because your shoulders are all like scrunched up. So doing like 15 minutes of some kind of stretch within a lesson, I think is sometimes more valuable than actually hitting the horn because it's spiraling backwards if you don't meet your instrument with an aligned and invigorated body. And because the, the mind is part of it, the mind and the body are, they're not just, there's not like, oh, here's my head and here's my body. They're, they're, they should be doing this flow of, of synchronized actions. And um, yeah, that could be, that could go back to that last question. You know, what are my distractions that those, those two to me are hand in hand. You've got to clear, you clear yourself in a way that you can, can really make the most out of them, the moment. Getting the body going before you even bring the mouthpiece into play. I mean, you know, you, you got to think about this. We're not supposed to be doing this. This is not, uh, I mean, our lips weren't designed to have this round circular piece of brass pressed up against it for hours and hours at a time. You have to prepare your body. Now, the the term warm up actually comes from the world of athletics it means literally raising the temperature of your muscles and depending on what you're going to do you have to focus on a different group of muscles like a baseball player has a different warm up than a football player and a tennis player has a different warm up than a golfer because they're concentrating and focusing on a different group of muscles so obviously for us we want to focus on the muscles in our face here and our lips and uh, like I, you know, the intercostal muscles here in between your ribs and the lower abdominals and you want to stretch, you want to get your body going a little bit like that, even though it may seem, well, that's really kind of simple and basic. Yeah, well, sometimes simple and basic are things that you need to do. And I always stretch and I get some, I get some blood flowing in there, I do some flapping. And, and a lot of trumpet players don't look at this. They say, this is, this is like, well, the frame your question, that this pretty neglected. A lot of people are just in too much of a hurry to get started. How about if, you, let's say one of those nights that I had a really hard gig before and I'm a little puffy in the morning, I'm not going to throw the horn up there right away cold without getting some blood in there. And, and, that, and all the time that you're doing the stretching and you're going your breathing you start thinking about what you're doing it's almost like meditation to go but to answer your question i think people should spend a little bit time with their just their body before they start bringing the mouthpiece and their horn into it and realize that we didn't come out of the womb with little trumpets i mean we're not supposed to be doing this i mean we're doing it because we're we're spiritual beings and we love the sound of the trumpet and we want to create music but 
why don't you give yourself a chance to feel halfway decent before you put the mouthpiece up there, you know? A couple things come to mind immediately. Um, number one is just rudimentary fundamentals, elementary fundamentals. Um, I see so many people practicing. I mean, I do, I do this a lot at uh, Cleveland Institute of Music where I teach or, or Northwestern. I'll try to find guys practicing. And I'll try to lurk outside the practice room and listen to what they're doing. And most of them are just banging away at something over and over and over and over again, like they're banging against the, their head against the wall, hoping that something's going to get better. I think that, you know, working on fundamentals and then finding musical application for those fundamentals is essential. I mean, just some of the most basic things, just, just starting a note, just whether it's a poo attack or a two attack, just having the air, just everything just converges. Everything is there with immediacy and ease. It just feels like the trumpet is just a natural extension of your voice. And then everything just feels like you're in a flow and everything's happening. Just, just ease and immediacy. Like you're just, as if you were singing, you just happen to be having this metal thing in your mouth. That's an extension of it. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of people that neglect fundamentals, like they'll do things. Most books go from low to high only. Very few books start high and come down or start middle and go up and come down and come back up. So, and you could hear that in different players and, and the way different people work. I look at books, an Arben book, Schlossberg, Stamp, you know, Bylin, Clark, any of these books, I look at that as a starting point, as a philosophical base, as a grounding point, but it's not an absolute. To me, they're living, breathing, evolutionary things that are constantly expanding and evolving that it's up to me to find more within it and find more variables within it, different ways to apply it and different ways to take it. And I feel like a lot of people look at it very static and just kind of play that. I feel like you've got to get more creative with your practice. I feel like that's, that's some of the most neglected things that people just kind of do absolute, especially as students, they, they just kind of do what the teacher told them to do. And to me, that's, that's like, that's the bare minimum. That's the starting point. It's like, okay, do that, but then also, how can you figure out other things to apply to it and other ways to apply it and other ways to, to dive deeper and, and, and go, go, you know, really drill down a lot further. So I would say that's, that's really the most neglected, you know, thing is probably fun, really just really thorough fundamentals and then also details. And I feel like it's very easy for people not to just look at the piece of music and just like follow what's on the piece of music especially with, with people like, like a Mahler or, you know, somebody who was, was very astute or Strauss. I mean, these guys knew their orchestration and instrumentation. They knew that what they were doing and it's very clear where, what their intention is. So, you know, understanding that intention or Stravinsky and understanding that intention and bringing those details to the forefront. I feel like that a lot of times, I mean, People do stuff that's very mercurial and kind of in the moment, and it's just, it doesn't have any basis reflecting what's in front of them. So I feel like there needs to be that basic understanding of what is the, composer, the composer's intention. And then once you know what the composer's intention is, then being able to bring that to light with the details, you know, in there. So I would say, you know, acute, thorough, and proper fundamentals and details. And probably there's a lot of, in the Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap on those. Another thing that I feel like has changed a little bit in the business, at least, at least my part of the business, people don't listen as well as they used to. They, their ensemble skills are not as, as, as acute. The older guys, I mean, granted, when I first got in this orchestra, still over half the orchestra were guys that George Zell had hired. And his whole acumen to blend, balance, ensemble, you know, correct um, reflection of the composer's wishes, um, you know, correct style. And, you know, a lot of these guys that, you know, they're just an 
this innate sense of style and listening across the band and like picking up a little thing somebody did, either color or articulation or a note length or, you know, the way they spun a phrase and the way that kind of fed around the band. I feel like people now, person for person, are much better players individually, much better. But that sense of style and understanding of style and the ability to listen and hear and kind of fit with the, that, that ensemble skill orientation, it's there. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of players who are fantastic, who really have that and have that innate sense of that. But I don't feel like that's asked as much. And I don't feel like it's not cultivated as much in just in general. So I would say that's that's something that, for me, feels like it, it could it could use a little bolstering. Really learning to use your ears, listening, listening, and close listening. And I remember having some students that were trying to go in one direction or another, but they weren't listening to the nuances, uh, like things like when to use vibrato, when not to use. Just the thought of vibrato didn't seem to enter, inflections didn't seem to enter into their uh, their wheelhouse. So really listening intently, seriously listening over and over, listen uh, uh, and just let it embed itself in your body. That's I think the main thing I would think, deep listening to the nuances and this is maybe controversial, but I recent, I was pretty good friends with Lee Morgan since I, I, I well, I mentioned earlier, my trumpet teacher, Tony Marcion was also his teacher. And Lee said something once that struck me, he said, you know, it's either hip or it ain't. So learning to make that distinction. Now, obviously it's subjective, there's music, but there's also an element of truth to it uh, as a jazz player. Yeah, and so you have to be hip to what's happening. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, uh, so that takes a lot of listening and close listening. I'm, I still, like I uh, have said, I, I listen every day to stuff, and and it's it's also inspiring, you know. So I think those are the main things. Also, use your ears when I try to learn a new tune. I always use my ears first, uh, and then try to look at what I missed and why I missed it, why I didn't hear it, put the chords that I can't hear. Now I know what they are generally. It's strange. It's like uh, E flat, D flat is the root. I don't hear that carefully. Uh, e minor seven to A seven. For some reason, that always simps. I, I can't hear it. Like G minor seven to C seven. Sure, I got it. F minor seven to B flat seven. I realized there were I was getting hung up on two or three tunes and I was getting hung up by ear on E minor seven to A seven. So utilizing your ears, I think is really important. Don't uh, forget that part of it too. I think maybe for preparation, it's the mindset because everybody focuses on, you know, um, playing the piece through and through and that every technical thing is uh, here but um, in order to play good at the concert um, you have to lose this practicing mode and this controlling analytical mode and to let go and just play without anal analyzing all in the head because then you are too distracted to play the music and I think that is the uh, thing that is most neglected because everybody is so focused on playing the right tones and not missing a tone or something but this letting go and this is something you cannot really learn I think you learn it with doing it so if you play many concerts it gets natural and you know it, uh, you get the routine and I, I see it with myself when I play like four um, um, four concerts in a year it's of course always a stress, uh, stressy situation. But uh, last year I played, I don't know, 30 or 40 concerts. And then it, this is of course something different because it feels natural. You do it very often and you know how your body reacts while I'm being on a stage. And then this letting go of, um, is more um, easy. But nobody really talks about that. Um, everybody's focused on, you have to, you know, don't miss the high note or something. and 
play really musically and have the right interpretation. But the really magical um, concert situation, um, concert situations you will only have if you are good at this letting go, because then you are free and you know the music flows, and this is um, really important, I think. In general, I think the finesse. In general, I think. Get the finesse. And, and delicate, sensitive, beautiful. Play pianissimo, right? I'll, I'll give two answers. I think for trumpet technique, purely technique, it's easily flexibility. Um, anybody that can do a lip trill can ignore everything I'm about to say. But if you can't, it's literally like so life changing. Not because you're going to do that. Maybe you will. But but because you learn, you've learned at that point. It's just a way of demonstrating that you're able to use your air to do all the work. It gives you range, it gives you endurance, it gives you a better sound, it gives you confidence. It's like previously you were you realized suddenly that the, the trumpet you were playing was the equivalent of those pianos that you see at like at a, at a, at a museum where you gotta like jump to like, and it's fun, you won't miss a note, but you can't play them more than an octave, you know, unless you're gonna take like a, an Olympian lit leap but once you've reached, you know, it's a continuum. Once you've reached the point where you can literally, you've demonstrated mastery of air. So that's the big one. And then for, um, I'll, I'll put another phys uh, technical one in there, is I think articulation, because and even though I, you know, I, I don't like that word because it implies a doing of something when really it's the undoing of something that makes the sound and that's a big part of it. But, and I could speak <clears throat> from classical students, especially that are suddenly thrust into an orchestra, you know, because they study like Mahler symphonies, you know, all these epic trumpet parts. But talk to somebody that has a job in an orchestra. That's not what's hard. That's hard. Don't get me wrong. What's hard is you're sitting there and then it's like, wrong. you know, like your worst note, the note that's in the range you feel the least comfortable with. The conductor is not clear. The stage makes you feel like you're playing by yourself. You're flat. Like, are you going to crack that note? You're probably going to crack that note. You know, you you work on not cracking that note by playing the softest, you know, whatever it is for you. For most people, and me, me included, it's like the soft, low. That That's the notes that don't, that are not likely to go well. And it's not as fun to practice those things but it's way less fun to be on stage thinking, oops, I forgot to work on that. <clears throat> so I would put definitely those sort of technical things. But I think for, for preparation, it would be doing something to prepare for the physical and mental reaction you're gonna have to suddenly being thrust into the spotlight. Because unless you perform every day, and again, you don't become a performer full-time overnight, you need to get used to it. If you were to suddenly play every night, it would kind of be easy. You just do it, but that's not how it happens. You got to prove yourself in these sparse events that are going to be nerve wracking because there are a few of them and each one matters. And you get one performance of everything, not like a hundred if you're touring versus touring. And so you need to prepare for that mental, that, that self-awareness you're going to have. If you prepare right, that self-awareness is amazing. It's like magic energy that you get you know from your audience and you're going to play better than you really are and it's incredible and your audience will appreciate it and you will too um, but if you don't that energy can turn into insecurity so then that inward energy feels like it's eating you alive and it can be absolutely horrible it's the worst feeling possible yeah you still might play well but you're, it's not fun so i would say it's you know <laughs> those three things flexibility, really careful art, you know, articulation or anything that's really weak for you. And then, you know, like doing something like push-ups or jumping jacks right before you play something that's scary 
is just going to prepare you to play it under the worst case scenarios. I mean, look at the way astronauts train. There is no room for oops. They just don't, that's not built into the plan. And it still happens, but they're doing something that's much more technically and, you know, demanding and cognitively. And think about this is one more thing I'll say, because, and th I hope this doesn't, you know, offend any of the school of thought of thinking of playing, but like there are schools of thoughts that are like, don't want to address physical or tech technical things. And, and they'd rather simplify it just thinking about air and singing. And again, I benefited from that approach, but I was lucky I was had set up well. But if you think about an astronaut, they're certainly not planning a, a space, like a, a ship to go to space, thinking like, listen, let's not think about all this crap. Just get that thing set up. Let's just get it out there. Just look where you're going and shoot that thing into the air. Like, no, <laughs> even the astronauts, they're not even really doing anything on the board of the ship nowadays. You know, like that SpaceX recent one. I mean, they're just sat there. It was completely automated. That was one of the records they broke, like a fully automated launch. But they still study the physics of the aerodynamics. They know every component of that spaceship, everything about it. And then when it comes time for launch, they take all that knowledge and they, they, they call it a one pager. They need to put it all so that it's like, you got five bullet points, airline pilots are similar. They don't ignore the, the aerodynamics just because it's not their problem. And I think that that's another aspect of uh, preparation that is worth you know, considering as a trumpet player you really want to dig deep into the art. Why purposely ignore a subject completely? You know, I, I've never taken an anatomy class specifically, but I can't imagine. I don't buy the theory that it's going to make me play worse. Well, you know, I've met a lot of younger players who have approached me for lessons and they immediately want to get into playing jazz and improvising and learning how to be able to play like Winton or, or Lee Morgan or Freddie Hubbard, um, but they're not fundamentally sound. So I honestly feel like the most neglected uh, things for, for, for people, for younger people, especially coming up to practice are fundamentals, you know, and the most basic of fundamentals is sound. That's one, one thing that I, you know, have issue with when I see a lot of these young players coming up um, when I go and I work with some of them, you know, who are students at Manhattan School of Music or Juilliard or, or the New School or, or my travels, wherever I go, the biggest thing I, I hear lacking in younger players is quality of tone. And it seems to be neglected by a lot of people for some reason. To me, that's the most important thing. That's what everything else comes from. If, if I'm playing and I don't have the tone in my head that I'm hearing in my mind, coming out the end of my horn, I'm, I'm at a loss for ideas of what to play when I'm improvising. I got to hear the sound that's inside of me coming out the horn. If I don't, then I struggle. And that's something that I feel is pretty neglected in um, like these, these days and times for some reason. Quality of our sound. I think too many times we get wrapped up in, in technical proficiency especially for younger players. It's like, oh, I want to play these, you know, these scales as fast as possible. And in jazz, you know, when, when you're crossing genres, everyone wants to learn the licks. Let's learn the licks. That's great. Of course. I mean, I'm, I'm still working on that. I'm a, I call myself a self-professed lead player with a dream. You know, I want to be able to play like, you know, some of my colleagues like Clay Jenkins and, and, and go down the list, right? Mike Rodriguez and, Gilbert Castellanos and, you know, Sean Jones and Nicholas Pay, you know, Roy Hart, that just are burning, right? You know, Scott Wenholt in New York, you know, just a lot of these guys that, that are just, that's effortless to them, right? Um, but I have to work at that. So, um, but to me, there's no point in even trying to figure those licks out if you don't have a good tone, if you don't, can't play in tune. You don't understand how to play with great intonation. Um, you know, uh, I think it's very important that, uh, that we spend more time on that. And I think that's one of the most neglected things and yes, long tones, of course, but there's other ways that are more practical that are less tedious 
then long tones, you know, um, with ballads and things like that, that you can use. I, I feel, I think it's about finding practical ways to improve that. I mean, it sounds cliche and we've, you've probably heard it from other players. You have to practice like you're performing. I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. It's interesting. I, I just taught a lesson today and the student was like playing through it and playing through their, their exercise or their audition piece, actually, you know, ch- slumped over. I'm like, what are you doing? Why do you think that you would be successful? You're not going to do that when you're recording the audition video. How do you plan on being successful if you're not practicing as you plan to perform? And it seems simple and it is, but it's amazing how many times uh, um, we have students that just, uh, and and ourselves as young players even just don't take stock in that. I'm not gonna be playing Malaganya from my favorite computer chair. I'm not gonna be playing, you know, (laughs) you know, begin the begin from my, you know, I'm going to be standing up in the particular shoes. I mean, all these things, right? Shoes. I don't wear a, I, I don't wear a tie a lot of times when I'm performing, you know, out front as a guest artist, because that's just restrictive to me. You know, even your apparel, what's comfortable for you. Spend a little bit more money to not have itchy underwear. Pay. I mean, it's as simple as that. No one wants to see you grabbing, you know, but, but I mean, the, in terms of preparation, if we're thinking about those things, those little details, it's all part of the presentation. It would be great if I could say like just one thing, but I think it's very individual for, um, for every single one of us. Um, and so then it will be something that um, maybe... If there's something I neglected that I should have, then that might be something that you didn't neglect. Uh, <laughs> but so I think um, for me, I just, well, and I think a lot of people say this, but I, I think the thing that is the most important, if someone asked me, is there like one thing, one thing that makes a musician, uh, a musician kind of, what is the, the one thing that, that is the most important thing? Uh, then uh, I would say uh, your voice or your identity. And then, of course, under that one thing, you need to have like all these things, like you need to have your toolbox with all, you need to do this. You need to to be, um, how do you say, um, structured with your, with your practice. You need to have talent for so many different things or... Or maybe you just need to be a really, really hard worker. Well, you need that anyway. But, you know, we have different different approaches um, as musicians to our craft, you know. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you are nothing um, if you don't have a voice. Um, so, and I don't think that people neglect it because I think everyone kind of thinks it. But then actually to focus on it um, and actually realizing how you can do that without it not just being something you say or something you've heard people say oh it's all about the music but then when you play there's really basically no phrasing going on but so it's like how what do you say and what do you do (laughs) so really the 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 it's it's a lot of hard work actually and it's not necessarily something that that you just magically have some some has it but it needs to be nurtured i mean it's it's like um my teacher did uh with me he just really he saw that i had this and he, and we've talked about this now uh like uh, like when you know we talked about how he experienced me uh when he became my teacher um when when he saw me as a 14 year old what did he think you know and then yes there was no big technical things it was it looked good it felt but the one thing that he really saw was was this uh, need and wish to be something special, like having my own voice. And then he, you know, did the nurtured and just tried to make that grow. And I think saying that you do it and actually doing it are two 
different things. So I would say maybe it's easy to neglect to actually do it in a proper way. High fundamentals, you know, your Schlossberg, your Arvin, that's probably yeah, the most neglected, at least for me in my experience. Yeah. Fundamentals and ear training and piano playing. I'm not any good at it. I'm actually sad, very sad. I think actually knowing how our breathing works is something that is not studied enough. And I say this as somebody who is just studying it more intently right now. Uh, I just, I recently had a baby. And as you can imagine, my, my body went through a lot of different changes as it was both growing and then now rehabilitating after that experience. And so I've been focusing a lot more on what are the the very, very, uh, you know, uh, incremental strength building sorts of things I can do in my core. Um, how do I link, link that with breathing? I mean, something even as simple as knowing, you know, breathing through your nose goes directly to your diaphragm. Like that's, that's one way just, just to know that about how this body works is I, I, I think it could be very helpful if developed. And also now I do, um, uh, an exercise routine in the morning that's stretching, but also really focuses on strengthening core muscles uh, in a way that is relevant to brass playing, as well as breathing strategies. We have to cover the different aspects of trumpet playing. You have to do some tonguing, you have to do some long tones, long tones, you have to do some uh, articulation of all kinds, you have to do some legato, you have to do some flexibility, you have to cover all those things to really feel prepared, you know. And um, if you got a special abilities or skill to play flexibility, that doesn't mean that you have to spend the whole freaking day and then you get neglected in all the things. You start, I mean, that, that, that's no good. It's better to cover all the aspects that we need to cover, you know. Music is an extension, like, of yourself. So, of course, you got to practice it and, like, run it over again and again to either get the notes, like, how to execute it like proficiently or technically but also I'm trying to think of a good way to explain it because for me it's like it's it's a moment where it clicks and I like I feel it in like my being my body and that it's just like I know it to an extent to where I'm I always say like making it musical to my kids but like being comfortable enough with it that you don't even have to think about like oh here's this you know high note coming or I got to make this octave jump that it's just, is you, you're not, yeah, you're just, everything's focused on like how beautiful and whatever the case may be to play it. Cause that, that's one of the most important things I think about when playing is like, how can I portray this in a way that the audience who hasn't been in 15 plus years of music <laughs> music education will like absorb and understand it so not understand it but feel it you know so that's like all all the all my favorite musicians it's like are anybody's favorite musicians do this thing very well so I think it's something worth like considering I think what's most neglected it or maybe I should say what I find myself telling people most often right when I hear them play for me um, is to put a lot of focus on what's happening between the notes right so we think so much about oh, mm, I want this nice sharp articulation great but then what's happening at the end of that note and then how is the next one beginning and what's happening what type of process is happening between those and so for me the easy word would be connection 
Um, I don't I don't know that people are totally aware that the easiest way to play the trumpet would be to connect all of the notes in the most seamless way possible. And for me, the underlying thing is the airstream that would be connecting all of those. Um, there's a misconception that articulating um, actually would stop the air, um, but I have done an extensive amount of work at this point on actually trying to work on articulating on the airstream so that the the wind is still moving as I'm articulating. Um, and so, for example, someone just played, you know, this lyrical solo for Mahler 5. Um, and it sounded beautiful, but there was absolutely no connection. And so the comparison that I like to make is to imagine you're a string player, right? And so at no point, if this is the, if the bow is the actual air stream, at no point are they stopping the bow to, to make each individual note, but there's a consistent fluid thing that's happening that connects all of them. And that's why they can get these most beautiful lyrical passages. Same thing with sliding up and down the board, right? We're not going beep, beep, beep. We're like sliding in between each one of these when you're looking for an extreme amount of lyricism just from my knowledge of string play, <laughs> which is not a whole bunch, but um, sometimes I wish trumpet playing was a little bit more visual because I feel like people would understand this concept a little bit better. And not only is it just like, this is what I think you should do, I actually think it's the easiest way to play the instrument. Um, and it's the thing that helps you produce the most beautiful sound. I think knowing exactly what you want to prepare is neglected part of it um to me when i'm practicing it's important for me to separate what part of the problem is due to say like chops like i'd say like mechanics and what part of it is a question of concept so in other words you know, we can blow something because our, our chops aren't responding. We can also blow something because maybe we're not really hearing it correctly, right? So, I mean, to really listen to yourself when you're practicing rather than just thinking that repeating repetition, repetition will solve something. It's like if you keep on repeating things and they're wrong, then, you know, then you're just, you're just going to reinforce the anxiety part of it. Wow, there is so much to think about after hearing all of their responses. Uh, I'm really interested to know which response you resonated with the most. Let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, why don't you hit that like and subscribe? It really helps this channel out a lot. Now, I personally loved these three ideas that kept popping up. Now, the first one, that was being in tune with your body and really understanding how the body can affect your practice and performance. The second was making sure that you are practicing for the performance, not just for note accuracy, and really deeply thinking about the music and how it personally relates to you. And number three was that our sound and musical voice are paramount to everything else. And of course, there is so much more to take away from this video, but I really loved how so many of these answers overlapped each other uh, across genre. You heard from so many different trumpeters, many of them saying the very same thing, and I just loved that. And that just goes to show how closely connected we all are as musicians, regardless of the styles that we perform. Now, today's advice was on recognizing and pointing out what's often neglected in practice, an important step in growing as musicians. Continuing on that theme of improvement and development, I decided to ask everyone the following question. What's one thing in your playing that you struggled with and how did you overcome it? Yeah, you're really going to want to hear what everyone had to say. I already know you are not going to want to miss this next installment. That's all I've got for you today. I want to thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.